So in class right now, we're covering cell membrane structure as well as the processes the cell membrane uses to control what goes in and out of the cell. Um, all of this information can be found in Chapter 5 in the textbook if you had checked one out for me. If you'd like to, check one out for me tomorrow. So remember in class that we discussed that diffusion is the movement of molecules with the concentration gradient. So this is going to be the definition that you get if you look in the textbook. Um, which essentially says the same thing, but the important thing to understand is that all molecules have energy, which makes them move, that's the kinetic energy, and that as they bump into it, to each other, they randomly change, and that the concentration gradient, so with the concentration gradient, and class is over, <laughs> with the concentration gradient means things move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So this is diffusion, and it can happen anytime, any place. This is the spreading out of materials. So think of um, when you drop a bottle of perfume in a classroom. It's highly concentrated in one corner, and it eventually spreads out. So it becomes less concentrated where it was originally and becomes more concentrated where it was not. We also discussed the lipid bilayer and that it's made out of lipids, which are types of fats, waxes, or oils. Um, this is a phospholipid bilayer because it contains a phosphate molecule on the head, and that's what makes it hydrophilic, which means it's attracted to water, whereas the fatty acid tails are hydrophobic and so repel water. This is important because those, that's how the membrane forms. So those hydrophobic tails are going to repel away from any water that might be outside or inside the membrane and they are going to point towards each other and those hydrophilic heads which are attracted to that water are going to then point towards the water and so you end up with this orientation of a bunch of hydrophilic heads pointed towards the water and a bunch of hydrophobic tails pointed towards each other to avoid that water and it creates this barrier through which no water can pass so my graphics didn't quite translate onto this slide, um, so I had to draw them in, so sorry about the sloppiness. Uh, so the important parts of the cell membrane, again, that transport protein and that phospholipid bilayer. And you'll see me, when I draw these, you'll see that I'll indicate what is outside and what is inside the cell so that we can talk about directions relative this, to the cell membrane. So one of the things you're going to have to be able to do is to compare and contrast passive and active transport. And passive is pretty simple. Um, if you think about somebody sitting passively in their chair in class, they aren't using much energy, they aren't expending much effort, and that's pretty much what passive transport is. The key things are that passive transport does not require energy to move materials. Um, it generally only works for the smaller molecules, although it will work for sugar up to a certain point. And then the really, really important things is that they move from high to low. Passive transport relies on that random movement of molecules and the chances are that, and the fact that um, molecules will diffuse to reach equilibrium. There are three basic types of passive transport that we're going to talk about. Diffusion, which we've already talked about. Facilitated diffusion, which is diffusion with some help. And uh, osmosis, which is the diffusion of water. So osmosis is the diffusion of water across the cell membrane. It still does not require energy, but it is facilitated diffusion, so it does require a protein. Because remember that water can't pass through that phospholipid bilayer. Those tails won't let it. So salt can't move across the membrane without energy, but water can. So what happens is if there is an area of high salt water concentration outside of the cell? So Concentration, let's just give it a concentration of 3 to 1. So remember that this is a ratio. So if this is your salt, um, and this is your water, and this is the environmental ratio, and inside your cell you have a 1 to 1 ratio, then you have more salt to water outside than you do inside, which means the water is actually more highly concentrated inside. And since the water is the stuff that can move without energy, it's going to start moving, and it's going to move outside the cell. So in this case, there's more salt outside the cell, less salt in, which means there's more water in, and the water's the thing that's going to move. 
and it's going to move out of the cell until it reaches equilibrium, meaning the same ratio of salt to water molecules on both sides of the membrane. Some of the vocabulary you'll see will be hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. Tonic refers to a solution. Um, when we're talking about osmosis, um, hypertonic is going to, hypotonic and isotonic refer to the concentration of the solution outside of the cell. So what is the environmental concentration? So hyper means many or lots, like a hyper person has lots of energy. So hypertonic means that there are, there's lots of solute, and that solute can be salt, it can be sugar, or anything else that's dissolved in the water. So a high solute concentration outside of the cell than it is inside of the cell. This is what can cause the cell to dehydrate. This is why if you drink salt water, you will die faster than if you had no water at all. Um, it actually will physically cause the cell to shrivel up. You can see it under a microscope. So what would happen if you put a freshwater organism into salt water? Well, the easy answer is it'll die, and that is absolutely true. But we don't want the easy answer. We want the correct answer, and the correct answer is the cells will dehydrate, and that's what causes death. So remember, organisms die from lots of different things, but in this case, it's dehydration of the cells on a cellular level that causes death. So, looking at this one, you'll see that the water is moving into the cell in order to equalize the concentration of salt to water on the inside of the cell with the outside of the cell membrane. Uh, this is called a hypotonic solution. So a hypotonic solution is the opposite of a hypertonic solution, and this is just as bad for a cell as a hypertonic solution because it causes the cell to gain water, and then the cell actually will pop. Um, and we usually in uh, science will say that the cell lyses or will lyse. Um, that's when a cell breaks open and spills its contents out into the environment, which sounds very dramatic and on a cellular level is, but it takes a while to um, show the effects for, for a multi multicellular organism because they've got a lot of cells that have got to go through this. So what would happen to your blood cells if the doctor put uh, distilled water? Well, they would lyse, and that's why they use a saline solution. It actually has a balanced concentration of salts in it, that is the same concentration as what's inside most people's cells. So that when the saline solution goes into your system, it can increase your blood pressure without causing the individual cells to lyse because their environment hasn't changed. So iso means same, so uh, same concentration on either side, and that's what we have right here. Uh, so this is a couple of graphics, pictures to show you what happens to cells in each of the three types of solutions. So the concentration of salt on either side of the membrane is very important, but it's the water that does the moving, and it moves opposite to what you think it would. So make sure that you're paying attention to uh, when we say there's more salt on the outside of the cell, we mean there's more water on the inside. So the water is going to be the thing that moves um, out of the cell to equalize the concentration. So facilitated diffusion is a lot like osmosis. It's diffusion, so everything moves without energy and it moves with the concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration, but it requires a doorway to move through. Uh, so people can get into a room, but they can't go through the walls. They require a doorway. That doorway facilitates the diffusion or the movement of something into the room. So in this case, the, um, the transport proteins are the things that facilitate that movement. So the membrane only allows certain small things to come through like um, oxygen or carbon dioxide and others can't go through because they're too uh, hydrophilic or too large so hydrophilic would be ions like um, hydrogen ions or potassium ions they stick to the water because they're charged and so they can't go through because the water can't go through. So these things are going to require doorways that specifically fit them. So certain transport proteins only allow certain substances in and out. So there's one protein um, that allows hydrogen through and then a different shaped protein might allow uh, potassium through. And so these proteins, uh, meanwhile you've got your hydrophobic bilayer here that's not allowing anything through except for oxygen carbon dioxide. So each protein is important because its shape is important. Uh, we'll do a, several labs in class, so make sure you have these notes with you so that you can do the labs and answer the questions.